Anna, but we can also post that at website. So, anytime. Okay, so All right, hi everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Bethany Sargent. I'm the Lake Champlain Outreach Coordinator with the Clean Water Initiative Program. Um, we're lucky enough to have Ben Copens, our watershed coordinator, here to talk about restoring Lake Memphis Magog. So that's specifically the uh, Memphis Magog Tactical Place Basin Plan and the Phosphorus TMDL. For the folks online, because um, we have a, quite a few of you, if you have questions, if you wouldn't mind typing them into your um, instant message on through Skype, and then I'll field them in the room. And then if anybody has questions um, in here. Just welcome to raise your hand. And Ben, do you prefer whether or not folks ask questions throughout or at the end? Yeah, I think it's fine to ask questions throughout. We don't want to try to get too far into the technical details, so we might uh, save some of those for the end. Okay. Great. Great. All right. Well, I'll turn it over to Ben now and get started. Yeah. Well, thanks. Well, thanks for everyone for coming out. Um, so my present today, presentation today is really about the Lake Memphis Magog Phosphorus TMDL and then really how we're implementing that through the tactical basin planning process. So I'm going to start out with a little overview of the Lake Memphis Magog watershed and some of the water quality challenges. A summary of how we did modeling to uh, calculate loading limits um, and set allocations be between different source sectors. And then also how we're going to implement the TMDL through the tactical basin planning process, really using our water quality sampling data with our volunteers to identify, prioritize, and evaluate the effectiveness of those projects, but then also through the development of partnerships to support the use of that data to really get these projects on the ground. So just a little bit about the Lake Memphis Phosphorus TMDL. So like most folks probably know this, but a TMDL is really a phosphorus budget that sets the maximum daily load is in the title, but when we look at phosphorus, we're actually looking at annual loading limits. Um, that will allow the lake to meet its water quality standard. In the case of Lake Memphis Magog, we have 14 parts per billion as the water quality standard for the lake. And so the TMDL identifies load reduction um, targets by source sector to meet that target loading. And then the tactical basin plan is really the first five-year implementation of the TMDL, which has a, a general 20-year time frame. And the idea is that future iterations of the tactical basin plan We'll evaluate how well we've done on this first five-year cycle, and we'll build on that um, to further um, identify and implement different projects to restore phosphorus, uh, reduce phosphorus levels. Um, so the Lake Memphis Magog Phosphorus TMDL was really developed in parallel with the tactical basin planning process, and then along with that, we also have a waste load allocation that was set for our wastewater treatment facilities through the same process. So we really did these three things on a parallel track, and the TMDL was approved by the EPA in September, and then our waste load allocation and tactical basin plan were signed in October and November of this year. So just to start back at the beginning, why do we care about phosphorus levels in Lake Memphis Magog? Well, we do have occasional cyanobacteria blooms, and one of the primary drivers of those blooms are phosphorus levels in the lake. And so this is a picture up in Eagle Point in the Lake Memphis Magog. And again, we're lucky in that Lake Memphis Magog tends to have these late in the year, so it doesn't impact too much of the recreational use of the lake. Um, but we also have increased algae and plant growth throughout the year that does impact that recreational use. So the graph at the bottom here is our um, average phosphorus values based on our lay monitoring program going back to the mid-80s. And you can see the red dotted line is our water quality standard, and so we're pretty consistently above that water quality standard. So if you look back to the late 80s, you do see that the levels were a little bit higher. And we think when the Newport Wastewater Treatment Facility was upgraded around that time frame, that that may have helped to reduce those phosphorus levels, but then they've been pretty consistent since the 90s through today. So just a little bit about the Lake Memphis Magog Tomophobia and Aquatic Watershed. And so we do have Lake Memphis Magog being the primary watershed for this basin. But we also have the Coaticook River, which includes the Norton, Great and the Labra Ponds, and uh, the Tomophobia River, which includes Stearns Brook and the outflow from Holland Pond, that are also part of the St. Francis River Basin. 
terms of the Lake Mefragog watershed, we have four major tributaries, the Black River, Bart River, and Clyde River. Um, and you can see the Clyde River in particular has a lot of large lakes on it, so that plays a really important um, role in how phosphorus moves through the watershed. And we also have the direct drainages right to Lake Memphremagog, including the smaller Johns River watershed. The Lake Memphremagog goes north of the Vermont border up into Quebec, and actually nearly three quarters of the lake is in Quebec. But the interesting thing is that most of the watershed is in Vermont. And so Vermont really drives what we see in terms of phosphorus levels in the lake. Um, and so to address this international water body, there's the Quebec Vermont Steering Committee on Lake Memphremagog. It meets twice a year. It really helps to coordinate our efforts um, to address water quality issues in Lake Memphremagog watershed. And the partners in Quebec and Vermont have worked together to do some of the water quality sampling and modeling to support the development of the TMDL. So in terms of land use, you know, this map shows land use. The areas in green are the forested areas. You know, the yellows and oranges are um, hay, pasture, and cropland. And you can see the Vermont portion of the watershed has a fair amount of agricultural land use, a little bit less up in the Quebec portion. Um, but that overall, we have about 5% of the watershed that's developed and about 17% in agricultural land uses. So aside from Lake Memphremagog, we do have a number of lakes and streams in the basin that are stressed or impaired due to elevated levels of nutrients, or in terms of lakes where we see some increasing nutrient trends. So we have mud and walker ponds that are listed as stressed due to elevated levels of phosphorus. You can see a picture here, an aerial photo of mud pond that's looking quite green. Um, again, really high levels of phosphorus leading to some algae blooms on that lake. Uh, we also have a large number of lakes Elago, Little, Great Averill, Holland, Long, Parker, Norton, Salem, Seymour, Shadow, Willoughby, that all have increasing nutrient trends. And so this is data based on our late monitoring program and our spring phosphorus sampling where we actually see phosphorus level increasing in these lakes in the watershed. We also have two tributaries, the Roaring Branch and Stearns Brook, that are considered impaired. Um, and when we look at Lake Memphremagog, a lot of the efforts to reduce phosphorus in the upland watershed up Lake Memphremagog as well as our Lake Memphremagog implementation plan help to improve water quality in these waters. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. So I also just want to emphasize that a lot of work has already been done to reduce phosphorus levels across the watershed. So we've done, our partners have done a lot of work to implement agricultural best management practices. We've really started working hard on some stormwater projects in the watershed working with our municipalities on road projects and doing things like buffer plantings on our lakes and rivers. So we've been doing lots of work over a large number of years. The Orleans County Conservation District tallied up some of the work that's been done on farms over the last five years. About $1.5 million has been spent in the watershed. And a lot of this focused on barnyard improvements, but a lot also focused on agronomic and grazing practices. So in addition to that, you can see the increasing trend. The graph at the bottom shows cover cropping. It's been planted, um, and the green line kind of shows the combined state and federal acres of that cover cropping. And you can see that's been increasing over the years, and I expect that when we look at the data for this year and coming years, it's going to continue to increase quite a bit. And then our graph in the middle just shows the miles of buffer plantings that have been done in the watershed working with some of our partners. And over the last... Uh, 12 or so years, we've done about 13 miles of buffer plantings um, in the Lake Memphremagog watershed. So again, we've done lots of work, but unfortunately it hasn't been enough to allow the lake to meet its water quality standard. And so now we need to develop our TMDL and we need to understand where that phosphorus is coming from. And we need to do that through our um, developing a Lake Memphremagog phosphorus model. So we do water quality monitoring in our four major tributaries. We have good estimates of phosphorus loading from those four major tributaries. But we also need to understand how much phosphorus is coming from those areas that drain directly to Lake Memphremagog. So that's one of the reasons we need to do this um, watershed modeling. Another thing we need to do is even where we know where the, how much phosphorus is coming in from our larger tributaries, we need to understand where it's coming from across the watershed. So how much of that phosphorus is coming from each of these different land uses? Um, 
And so again, this watershed phosphorus export model was initially developed with partners up in Quebec through a collaborative process. Um, we developed it to model the whole Lake Memphremagog watershed, and then we've really worked on it in Vermont to support the development of the Lake Memphremagog TMDL. So I'm not going to get too far into the weeds of the, the modeling. We could spend a whole presentation on this, but just trying to go over the real basics of how this model was put together. So it's called the Land Use Phosphorus Export Model. And it's actually a relatively simple model that uses um, average phosphorus export values for each of the different land uses that have been published in the literature and applies that to our areas of land use across the watershed to estimate how much loading comes from each of those different land uses. But to that, we've added an estimate of loading from stream channel instability, from septic systems, and then also from our wastewater treatment facilities based on monitoring of those uh, facilities. So we've taken all this data. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of lakes in the Lake Memphis watershed. So another thing we had to consider was how many or how phosphorus is lost in some of these lakes before it makes its way down to Lake Memphis so when we monitored phosphorus levels in the Clyde River watershed, there were about you know, less than half of what you'd expect, or less than half or almost a, a third of what we saw in the Black and the Barton River watershed. And the primary reason for that is that a lot of that phosphorus is lost in those lakes as that water makes its way down. So if you think of up an island pond, water has to go through a series of five or six lakes before it makes its way down to Lake Memphremagog, and each of those lakes removes somewhere between 15 to up to about 60% of that phosphorus in those lakes. So what this map shows is how we estimated how much of the phosphorus makes it to the main segment of Lake Memphremagog off of those different areas of the watershed. And so you can see right around Lake Memphremagog, there's a large area that essentially all of that phosphorus we predict makes it to Lake Memphremagog. You look at the lower Clyde River watershed, you can see these areas in reds um, up to the yellows, where we expect about 45 um, to about 75 percent of that phosphorus is making it down to the lake. But if you look, a majority of the watershed is in this dark green, where we expect about 30 to 45 percent of the phosphorus that's washed off the landscape is actually making it down to Lake Memphremagog. And then we have a few areas up above Seymour or Willoughby where we predict only you know, 5 to 15% is making it down. So again, if you're implementing a best management practice right around the lake and you reduce a pound of phosphorus, you expect to see a pound of phosphorus less coming into the lake. If you're up above Seymour, that same pound might only reduce a tenth of a pound by the time it makes it down to the lake Lake Memphremagog. So the final step in this modeling process was to calibrate and adjust those land use export coefficients so that we could better match our measured versus our model phosphorus loading. And so the way we did this was we have all this data in Excel, and we also have our measured loading for our four major tributaries, but we also have estimated loading from 24 minor tributaries across the watershed. And these were really important because these minor tributaries have a really broad, or some significant differences in the land use. So some of these are almost entirely agricultural, other ones are dominated by developed land. And so they gave us a better way to uh, see how much of those different land uses was really impacting the phosphorus loading. And so we set it up in Excel to automatically adjust those export coefficients until we best matched our measured and modeled loading. And you can see in the end our um, model does a pretty good job of matching what we expect to see or what we measured in our tributaries based on um, what we modeled. Um, so again, that was... Uh, so we went through this whole process, and really the important outcome of that was this pie chart that tells us what we estimate the phosphorus loading from all of the different land uses across the Vermont portions of the Lake Memphremega watershed. And so if we look at this pie chart, you know, agricultural land makes up the biggest piece of the pie, followed by what we lumped as the other sources that include stream bank erosion, with about 20%, water and wetlands from about 3% and then forest lands from about 9.5% of the phosphorus loading. If we look across our developed lands, we have our dirt roads that we estimate being about 8%, our paved roads about 1% of the phosphorus loading, and then all the other developed lands that aren't roads essentially making up about 
eight and a half percent of the phosphorus loading from the lake, with the remaining two and a half percent and one and a half coming from separate systems and wastewater treatment facilities. Across the agricultural landscape, we estimated about 19 percent coming from hayland, six percent from pasture, 14 percent from cropland, and then agricultural production areas we estimated being about seven percent of the phosphorus loading. And if you look at this pie chart and compare it to what they included for the Lake Champlain TMDL, it's pretty similar, with maybe the exception of the agricultural production area being quite a bit higher. And again, that was because based on some of the calibration, we used a much higher export coefficient for those. So now that we know We've estimated where that phosphorus is coming from. We've been able to estimate how much phosphorus is coming in from our major tributaries and across those unmonitored segments of the lake. We need to understand how much we need to reduce that phosphorus to allow the make lake to meet its water quality standard. And it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between those two. And Lake Memphremagog is similar to Lake Champlain in that the water quality conditions aren't the same in each portion of the lake. So we really needed to break the lake up into a number of different segments. And we needed to understand how much water moves back and forth between those different lake segments. And we did that um, by doing a chloride model because chloride is a conservative element that doesn't settle out in those different lake segments. So once we understand how much water moves back and forth between those different lake segments, we have an estimate of how much phosphorus is coming in to each of those lake segments from our watershed, we can then calculate how much of that phosphorus settles out to the bottom in each of those different lake segments. And we did this through a steady state model that essentially assumed that the water quality level stayed the same in the lake all the time. And then you can adjust how much phosphorus is coming into the lake and see how the lake would respond to those adjustments using this model. So when we did all this modeling, essentially we, um, or, through this modeling, you know, the segment that we really are focused on is this Vermont lake segment. And through this modeling, our phosphorus concentration in that lake segment was about 3% less than what we measured. And so we added 3% to the typical 5% margin of safety for the TMDL to come up with a 8% margin of safety. In addition to that, we need to reduce phosphorus loading overall by 29% to meet our water quality standard for the lake. So now we know how much we need to reduce our, reduce our phosphorus levels to Lake Memphremagog, and we need to understand what we need to do on the landscape to achieve those load reductions. And so to understand that, we developed what's called the Lake Memphremagog Scenario Tool. And this essentially allows us to estimate the load reduction achieved by applying best management practices to a portion of the watershed. So it's really the, the key to this is phosphor removal efficiencies um, for each of the different best management practices that we're applying. And these were derived from the Lake Champlain scenario tool. And those were based largely on a model that's called a soil and water assessment tool um, that estimated how much phosphorus load reduction you get for each of these best management practices, as well as drawing some from the literature about those efficiencies. And so we um, built this scenario tool that essentially connected directly to that lake model so you could apply these best management practices. And then in this model, you could essentially see how the lake would respond in terms of the phosphorus concentrations to those different best management practices. And then we use the same scenario tool to derive the waste load and load allocations for the different source sectors. So essentially figuring out how much by applying this best management practice scenario we're going to reduce phosphorus across different land use sectors. And so this is really the scenario tool. Um, and on the left here are all the different land uses that we apply these different best management practices to, the area of those land uses in the lake, and then the loading to the lake. And then you simply would select the best management practice, how much of the landscape you apply that best management practice to, and then the scenario tool says, well, how many acres are treated through that? And then calculates a load reduction based on that best management practice efficiency. So in this top example, we have a ban on fertilizer use. So you'd wonder, why don't we say 100%? Because you know, supposedly everyone should be following that law. But it turns out you know, most people didn't apply fertilizer before the law went into effect. So you can't really 
apply a best management practice that's already in, in place. And so they did a lot of studies in Lake Champlain to figure out that you know, this law should really change about 12% of folks that are applying fertilizer to their lawn. So you can kind of go down through this list and look at the different best management practices that we're applying. You know, we're looking at riparian buffers on our developed pervious and impervious surfaces and applying that to about 5% of the watershed or, or of that land use. Um, and so again, these are pretty big areas that we're talking about applying these best management practices to. So in nearly 460 acres of developed pervious lands and about 101 acres of developed impervious lands. And we're really focused on that, looking at a lot of our upland lake areas where we have a lot of development right along our lake shores. And again, you can kind of go down through this list. And a lot of the, this was really derived working with partners in the watershed to look at some of the regulations that have come into effect and think about um, what the implication of some of those regulations and also our incentives and technical outreach, what best management practices do we feel is most reasonable and which ones are going to be the most effective at meeting our load reduction targets. So I don't know if folks have any, <laughs> there's a lot of modeling and I know it's a <laughs> getting into some of the, the details here. Um, but again, a lot of this is pretty similar to what was done for the Lake Champlain um, TMDL. So when we do all of those different best management practices in that table, you can see the phosphorus loading pie gets reduced um, by about 35,000 pounds. Um, and again, what our TMDL is really made up of is these targeted load reduction percentages across these different land uses. So when we're looking at our wastewater treatment facilities, we reduced our permitted loading by about 33%. Across our developed lands, we have a reduction of a little over 18%. From our farm production areas, it's a reduction of about 65%. Across our forested and wetland areas, we have a reduction of about 3.5% and 23% reduction um, based on addressing some stream channel erosion, 46% reduction across farm fields, and in total that averages out to a 29, approximately 29% reduction across all of the phosphorus loading in the watershed. So that's our TMDL. So how can we make it happen? So one of the key elements is Act 64, Clean Water Act, that strengthened a number of regulations across the state of Vermont. And so we have our required agricultural practices, small farm regulations, municipal and state road um, permits um, through the stormwater program updating regulations, um, there's stormwater regulations with regards to previously unpermitted three acre parcels or parcels that don't meet the current stormwater standards, acceptable management practices for forestry. But then also Act 64 really talks about um, the requirement that all of our water quality improvement actions are integrated by the means of our tactical basin plans and establishing partnerships with regional planning commissions, conservation districts, and other organizations to support this work. And so that last one is what I'm really going to focus on for the rest of this presentation. Um, and kind of before I, one of the key steps in terms of the tactical basin plans is that we first figure out where are our water quality issues across the watershed. So I've kind of listed off some of those water quality issues. And one of the key tables in the tactical basin plan are these priority sub-basins for remediating um, these phosphorus sources. So we have our water quality sampling of our tributaries. We have our lake sampling. We have our stream geomorphic assessments. And these identify areas where waters don't meet our water quality standards or where we have some concerns. And then at the end here, our final column talks about what are some of the priority actions we need to do in some of these watersheds. So the tactical basin plan really takes it the next step. And we work with partners to do things like stormwater master plans, lake-wise assessments, identify source areas on farms, and then work with our municipalities on their municipal road general permit to really target implementation actions where they can have the biggest impact. So the Lake Mifamagog Tomophobia and Aquatica Tactical Basin Plan has 66 summary strategies, and then we have over 350 specific projects in our Watersheds Project database, which is available online for different partners to look up those projects that they might want to implement. So 
So we have our huge list of 350 actions. We kind of know where we want to do these. I think the key last step is really figuring out who and how we can get these things to happen on the ground. And so I think that's been something I've really enjoyed working on in the Lake Mifermagog watershed. And we've really tried to focus on this through two collaborative efforts. One is the Mifermagog Stormwater Collaborative that the Mifermagog Watershed Association is leading. And then we also have a Mifermagog Regional Conservation Partnership Program grant that really focuses partners across the agricultural landscape. And so both these efforts are really defined by partners working together to identify, fund, and install those priority practices. So in terms of our Met for Magog Stormwater Collaborative, we have our lake associations that are our key partners, our municipalities, as well as our Regional Planning Commission, the Agency of Transportation, our Better Roads Program. We have a number of partners um, that are really involved in both the stormwater and our um, Regional Conservation Partnership Program. So we have the Met for Magog Watershed Association, Department of Environmental Conservation, Northwoods, our local conservation districts. And then in terms of our Regional Conservation Partnership Program, we have our NRCS and USDA, Sterling College, Fritz Gerhard with Beck Pond LLC, the University of Vermont Extension, um, NOFA Vermont, and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and actually a number of different folks within that agency. Um, that work closely with us in that arena. So again, we're really thinking about how we can pull all these partners together and figure out who can best support. Well, first of all, make sure we all have a common understanding of what we think needs to happen across this watershed, and then figure out how to best do that and fund that work. So I'm going to kind of zip through a few of these um, different areas. And so the first is the Mint for Magog Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Again, this is a $674,000 grant over five years. And the idea is that it really supports our nutrient management planning courses for farmers, provides technical assistance to farmers to install practices, as well as provides some financial assistance for that work. And in addition to that, we have a, a matching of amount of funding that partners have committed to the same project. And then one of the key elements here is that we really use our water quality monitoring data to support where we're targeting these efforts. And then finally, to evaluate the impact of these. So I kind of have this as a little circular diagram with all these different steps, and not necessarily every project involves all of these different elements. But in the general sense, we're using our nutrient management planning and our water quality sampling, as well as our folks that are working on the compliance for our medium, large, and small farms to identify where we have these problems that we need to solve. We're providing some technical assistance to farmers and then trying to link those up with different funding sources that can best fund those different practices. And then we're also working on doing workshops with farmers to encourage them to participate. And then in the end, we're also doing our water quality sampling again to see how effective these practices have been at reducing those phosphorus levels. And then a final step where we've seen success is really celebrating that and publicizing where these practices have been effective at reducing phosphorus. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how the water quality sampling is integrated into this. So we have a volunteer monitoring program that's sampled over 166 sites in the watershed over 11 years. And we probably have another 25 sites to add to that this year. We sample eight times a year with two of those targeted towards rain events. We sample for total phosphorus, nitrogen, and turbidity in the past, although we dropped turbidity this past year so we could really expand how many different sites we could sample. And we do this through a partnership with, really led by Fritz Gerhardt, working with partners including the Memphis Magog Watershed Association, Northwoods Stewardship Center, and the Orleans County Conservation District. And we fund this through a number of different sources. And the key is that we really take the results from this data and present it through the Memphis Magog um, Agricultural Partners Work Group to really help to use this data to drive where we're implementing practices. And so this is a map that was derived from all that water quality sampling data. And essentially, these areas in yellow to purple are the folk target areas where we're focused on phosphorus reduction. So if you look at this, those areas make up about 13% of the overall watershed area. Um, and the idea is that we're really focusing our implement, implementation efforts 
in those sub-watersheds. And I'm going to talk about three areas where we've focused some of this work over the last couple of years. So the first of these is the Maxwell Farm. And so this is a farm that Sarah Damsell, who works for the Orleans County Conservation District, has been working with. And he was interested in implementing some best management practices on the farm. And so we worked with him to set up eight sampling sites around the farm to see if we could identify any source areas that might be a good focus for those best management practices. And the idea is that we really want to use this data to help inform which practices are going to have the biggest impact. And then come in after the fact to see how effective those practices have been. So an example where we've done this work is a tributary to Stearns Brook. We had about I think, 10 sample sites in this sub-watershed. We identified some high phosphorus source areas along this impaired tributary. And we mapped out what was contributing to those different source areas. We identified some phosphorus sources within those sub-watersheds. And then we worked with a farmer to install a clean water diversion project and also implement a large filter strip above where that water was coming down. And based on our water quality sampling, we saw you know, a nearly two-order drop in uh, phosphorus levels in this small stream. So again, we've been able to go back and see some pretty significant impacts based on this work. So another example of that is a small stream that drains directly to Lake Ventromagog. And so this is a case where we went out and did some water quality sampling with the Watershed Association. We found some elevated levels of phosphorus. And then kind of on a separate path, the NRCS started working with a small organic farmer in this watershed and installed a number of, did a complete barnyard overhaul and installed some pasture fencing and some other work in this watershed. And so after we heard that that happened, we went back in to do some water quality monitoring. And we did some estimates of phosphorus loading in this watershed um, that suggested this project reduced phosphorus loading by about 80 kilograms, or about a 50% reduction over the phosphorus loading before these projects were installed. So again, here's one of our success stories. So we've just worked with the Mentromegog Watershed Association in Orleans County Conservation District to really publicize this success story. And again, this kind of has two audiences. We're really looking to encourage other farmers to get involved with us to help resolve some of these issues, but also so other folks across the watershed can see some of the good work being done. So another interesting part about this story is that you know, we, I talked about that scenario tool. So we actually tried to apply that scenario tool to this small sub-watershed and apply these different best management practices that the NRCS install on this small farm. And we also included our ban on phosphorus fertilizer that went into effect over this time frame. And so based on that, we estimated a phosphorus reduction of about 17% across this watershed. So again, this is an example that shows, in this case, the phosphorus load reduction achieved through this project was actually higher than what we had used in our uh, scenario tool. And again, I think in, most, in many cases, these things are going to be more effective or less effective on an individual basis. But again, it gives some credibility to our um, modeling work that we did. Kind of moving out of the agricultural sector and into the stormwater world. Again, stormwater is a little more complicated than working with farmers in that there's a lot, there's a lot more people that have individual houses that generate stormwater. There's a lot of different target audiences that generate um, some stormwater pollution that we need to reach. And so the idea was that we we're going to form a Lymphomagog Stormwater Collaborative to really figure out how to best target each of these audiences and work with a lot of partners that might have some overlapping involvement with a number of these um, different sectors of the community. And so we came up with this idea last year, working with the Memphis Mega Watersh Association. A number of us went to the Leahy Summit and put together an application for High Meadows funding to support this effort. And the Watershed Association received a $40,000 grant to really kick off this Memphis Mega Stormwater Collaborative. And kind of the first step in this process is to take some of these general ideas about how we're going to tackle each of these different sources and really get down into the specifics of how we're going to address phosphorus loading across these different sectors. Um, and the idea is that hopefully through getting grants targeting each of these different source sectors, the person that the Memphis Mega Watershed Association hired would be a sustainable position over the next 18 months. Um, 
And another important part of this is that some of the funding through this grant is also dedicated to some of the partners working in the watershed. Because again, it's not any one organization that's going to be able to address these issues. So again, I'm just going to kind of zip through a few of these source sectors and talk a little bit about some of our initial discussions. So when we talk about roads and rivers, you know, the real driving force behind this is our new municipal road general permit. And Jim knows all about here. Uh, <laughs> People have, want to get the details, um, but that permit is um, being developed right now. And a key part of that is that towns are going to have to do what are called road erosion inventories. They're going to have to inventory their road and see where roads go meet the uh, standards for roads for connected road segments. Once they do those, they're going to have to develop these road implementation plans. And then there's an, some state funding that can help support towns in implementing these different practices. So in our discussions, you know, what we're really talking about is how to best support towns in doing this work. So we have a lot of small communities up in this watershed that might not have the technical resources to do this work on their own. And so the idea is how can we pull together partners to most efficiently work with each of these towns, try to identify who might be the best partner to work with those towns, what kind of support the town might need in completing these road erosion inventories, and then also continuing to work with those towns once we do those inventories to help them apply for the grants and do the work necessary to get those projects on the ground, and really trying to focus on where those can have the biggest water quality impact. So if we look at our LakeWise um, program, you know, this is a program that was developed a number of years ago that really looks at lakeshore development and is really trying to change the culture of lakeshore development, where in the past a lot of people thought the best approach was a lawn right down to the lake and trying to encourage the restoration of buffers along our lake shore and also treating some of that stormwater runoff from those properties. And so that we have two lakes in the watershed, Echo and Seymour Lakes, that have been really active in this program. And are the first two lakes um, to have over 15% of those lakes meet uh, lake-wise standards. And so that's a really exciting thing. And then this is a picture here of a Best management practice that was uh, installed at the Shadow Lake Beach in the watershed last summer, working with the Northwood Stewardship Center through a work crew um, grant that was received through the Ecosystem Restoration Program. So what we're trying to do is really take all these assessments. So this is a map, and it's available online. It shows you where all of these lake-wise assessments have happened across the watershed. And you can see again, Echo and Seymour Lake have been really pushing this program. You know, some of our other lakes a little bit less so. But each of these lake-wise assessments, when we're going out there and looking at that, we're identifying potential projects that could be implemented. And so what we're really looking to do is figure out a way to work with those individual landowners to provide the resources to get these different practices installed to address some of the water quality issues around lake shores. We also have our large-scale stormwater practices. Um, in this case, um, you know, this picture here is of a practice that was installed in the town of Brighton. So the town of Brighton worked with the Essex County Conservation District to do a stormwater master plan, and they installed two large stormwater treatment practices in the community. But we also have a Mitch Magog Watershed Association that developed the stormwater master plan for the remaining communities, or for four major communities in the watershed, that identified 20 potential retrofit sites. And so what we're really talking about now is trying to move some of these practices from that preliminary design stage into project implementation. And so the Watershed Association has a grant to work with the city of Newport on a project. And the idea is that it really actually takes a lot of work to move from the stormwater master plan into that final implementation phase. And so there's lots of meetings with towns um, that needs to happen. And so that's what we're talking about in terms of the stormwater collaborative helping with that. We're also looking at kind of generally increasing community understanding of stormwater best management practices and what individual landowners can do on the landscape. And there's an example here of a pamphlet that's been produced in the Lake Champlain watershed. But we're also really looking at doing these small rain barrels, rain gardens, and really getting the word out about different things individual landowners can do to address some of that stormwater runoff. So the kind of final sector that's kind of removed from those two efforts is our wastewater treatment facilities. As I said, we're looking at a 33% reduction in the permitted loading. And that 
the waste load allocation sets those annual phosphorus loading limits in addition to the current permits for those facilities. Um, but in actuality, you know, we don't expect that these reductions and those permit limits are going to require any significant investments on the part of those communities. But the new permits are going to require some optimization. And so we're hoping that through that process, we'll be able to reduce some phosphorus loading from those wastewater treatment facilities. And so, you know, as you guys are probably overwhelmed with all this information that I've tried to provide today, it's been great working with Bethany to try to take all this information and put it into some fact sheets that are understandable to the local community. And so as part of the uh, putting out the tactical basin plan and TMDL, um, Bethany's produced these fact sheets that describe the Lake Mifamega watershed, some of the phosphorus targets and why actions are needed, and then they outline specific actions to reduce phosphorus by land use. We're also going to be doing some targeted workshops and presentations of the TMDL and Tactical Basin Plan in the watershed. And then again, I think a lot of this work requires one-on-one -on -one meetings. And again, I think that's where the Stormwater Collaborative and the Regional Conservation Partnership Program come into play. Yeah. I don't know if folks have any questions. I know it's a lot of... <laughs> Nice work, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> and Beth. Yes. Those fact sheets are great. Thanks. Yeah. Any questions from folks online? In the room? We know how much this is going to cost. Did you already cover that? Did I miss? No, okay. I didn't. <laughs> cover that. And it's one that's a little bit tough to, to get a handle on. So we've looked at that cost in a couple different ways. So the legislature has really looked at costs statewide for implementing Act 64. And so you can kind of look at this watershed, which is about 5% of the state, and do some extrapolations from that. Um, and I'm not sure what those numbers are off the top of my head. Um, I have gone through and tried to take that little scenario tool and apply some costs associated with that, but it gets really hard because there's a lot of assumptions that have to be made in terms of how much buffer it takes to treat an acre of cropland. Those things aren't always, you know, straightforward calculations. Um, but it does, it, it is a pretty substantial amount of funding, you know, particularly when you talk about some of the agricultural work that needs to happen, um, the road projects and stormwater projects, you know, and again, I think that's why we really try to, um, through the tactical basin plan, focus these efforts where they can have the biggest impact. So essentially trying to make the most of every dollar we spend um, to have the biggest impact on reducing phosphorus loading. Other questions for Ben? So what do you mean by uh, the optimizing at wastewater treatment facilities? I should know more details about what <laughs> what exactly that means, but essentially what my understanding of it is that through permits, you know, we're not talking about requiring facilities to do major upgrades, but trying to take what facilities they have and most efficiently remove phosphorus at those facilities by maybe tweaking some of the different processes that they use. So really trying to kind of adjust some of those ways they operate those facilities to remove the maximum amount of phosphorus without major investments at those facilities. So I don't know. Or we might have... <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's more process related. So it could be the way they change operation of the aeration basins. It could be an existing chemical addition. Just trying to tweak here and there to basically separate more of the phosphorus from the waste stream. But it doesn't require a full bloom upgrade. It doesn't require the addition of tertiary treatments. Okay. Well, I just um, want to remind everybody, so we offer this lecture series through the Clean Water Initiative. It's the second Thursday of the month, September through June, and all of our lectures are recorded and posted on our Clean Water Vermont YouTube page. So if you're not able to make one, you can find past lectures there. Um, and then we also have a schedule posted on our <coughs> outreach page for the Clean Water Initiative. And for folks in the room, if you haven't signed the sign-in sheet yet, if you could do that and 
if you want to be on our mailing list and aren't already, it would be helpful if you just put your email address down as well, and um, I can add you to that list. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ben. Yep. And hopefully we'll see you next month. And if anyone did want to take a look at some of the draft fact sheets and tactical basin plan or TMDL, we've got some of those. Yeah, these are kind of 